Welcome to your host this evening, Chris. Hey. Honestly, you feel like I'm on a TV show or something. So are we impressed? How good does it look tonight? Yeah. Have you had a good day? Yeah. Yeah? Best event yet? Yeah. We keep getting comments. How are you going to top this one? Not until our 20th birthday, so we're going to have to wait. <laughs> So, how was Nemesis? It's all good. I'm really glad that they got it open in the end. We would have had Galactica, but it's not quite the same, is it? So, I still firmly believe it's the best ride to have ERT on, and it was a few years ago. Raise your hand if you were here at Nemesis at 20. Quite a few of you. So that is the last time John kindly gave us his presence. Um, so we are very, very grateful to have John here again tonight. I hope you are ready with your, Q and, uh, your questions. Um, I know John very much wants to share his passion for the industry. He is retired, but still consults here and there for Merlin. He's been working with Chris today, it's on the fireworks display. Um, so there may be some input in that. Um, so I will get off the stage, um, so welcome John Wardley. Thank you very much, Chris. And, and thank you for letting me share today with you. I, I, I mean, it's as much of a thrill for me to see everybody here and to be part of your 15th birthday celebration. So, thank you. When, when Chris asked me, oh, a long time ago, last September I think it was, if I'd be able to come today, I said, yes, of course. And he said, perhaps you could talk to everybody. And I said, well, they don't want to hear me rabbiting on. They've heard, they've heard the same old stuff year after year after year. I've got nothing new to say but I don't mind answering some questions. So that's what we agreed to do. Uh, the floor is yours, and, and I'm very happy to, to answer whatever questions you've, you've got, within reason. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll hand the floor over to you, and, and as I say, whatever you want to know, I'll do my best to, to answer it. A bit of a controversial question. What do you think of Galactica and what they did to Air? Now, I'll tell you the honest truth. I have never ridden it. I, I did go on it when they were testing the gizmos and things before it opened. Um, but I have not ridden it properly. Um, the one thing that I did think would be an improvement to the ride was, as a lot of you know, we had uh, plans to do an awful lot of theming on the original air ride. Uh, the tunnel was going to be fully themed and um, <laughs> special effects and amazing landscaping and props and different artifacts around the track. That never happened for two reasons. One was we ran out of money and when you're owned by a big public corporation like Merlin, you can't go over budget. And we never got over budget before, actually, with all, all the previous rides. We're dead on budget. So there's no question of going over budget. Um, and also we ran out of time. So the tunnel had all the atmosphere of uh, a cross between a public convenience and underground car park. <laughs> left the station. And I thought, well, at least virtual reality is going to turn that into something much more fantastic. And certainly what I saw on that test run did impress me. Um, they haven't got the synchronisation between the, 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 the top of the lift and, and back into the station right, so I can't really <coughs> say what, what, what the ride was like. But I certainly thought that that had great potential. Um, but other than that, um, I, 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 I don't know is the simple answer. Yeah. Next question. Someone's coming around with a microphone, so uh, it's up to them what, who they pick on. John, what are your opinions on SW8? <laughs> oh, I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> Right, let's get SW8 well and truly out of the way. As you know, I retired 
theoretically after 13 was built. So that was before, before the Smiler. Now, I was having lunch with Ian Crabb, the divisional director here, last August. And he said to me, how do you think the SW8 project's coming on? I said, pardon? <laughs> He said, well, how do you think it's coming on? I said, I don't know anything about it. I'm not part of the team. I don't know what it is. I don't know where it is. Well, I said, I've heard rumours, but I don't officially know anything about it. And he said, well, that's a massive oversight. We thought that you were part of it. I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> so he said, well, we'd like you to be part of it. So I said, well, it's easier said than done because you can't join a team when something has already been designed and then kind of throw in your, your comments and, and so on. So he said, well, you better leave it with me. Well, the phone was then red hot for, for a few hours and I got a phone call from Mark Fisher from, from Merlin's head office saying, um, we'd like you to be part of the team. And I said, well, I'm told by Orton Towers the ride's already been designed. Um, I don't think it's a good idea for me to now get involved. So he said, well, I think you need to be involved. So as you probably know, Alton Towers and the parks don't actually design their rides anymore. It's done by Merlin Magic Making down in London. And so they're in control of all the projects. And I said, if I am going to be part of the team, it's most important that the invitation comes from them. So then I do get an invitation to come to a meeting, which I came to. I said, I will come to a meeting no, I said, I'll come to two meetings. That was in the September and October of last year. And I'll write a report as to what I think the ride is like. Which I did. And I wrote a report. And I said, I thought that Great Coasters had responded extremely well to the brief that had been given them. But I had major reservations about a number of uh, parts of the, the, the profile. I thought the ride layout was very good, but I, I had reservations about the profile, particularly the first drop, which I thought was absolutely atrocious, uh, and a number of other areas around the track which I thought could have been improved enormously. And they said, well, the trouble is the foundations have already been designed. We can't make any changes. And I said, well, that was what I was concerned about. But I said, if, if you want me in any way involved, you're going to have to change the first drop because I don't, I don't think it's very good. And they said, well, if you're so smart, you better show us what you mean. <laughs> so I, I quickly jumped onto No Limits and I, I, I produced an amended version of the first drop, which they admitted was or actually amended version of the first two drops, which they agreed was a big improvement. And very reluctantly, they agreed, or at least first of all, they sent it over to Great Coasters, and Great Coasters agreed, agreed it was a big improvement. Uh, and they agreed that they would redesign the foundations of the first part of the track. And I said, right, now what about two other areas? And they said, no, it's too late. So. I think what you're going to get is a good fun ride. Um, <clears throat> it's not a John Wardley ride, but it's a good fun ride uh, with some amazing special effects, some great, great theming, tremendous theming, um, and I, I do think it will be a, a, a superb attraction to complement Alton Towers. I have said that I will not be part of the promotion and the, and the PR stuff leading up to it, so I am going to be probably teaching someone else how to stand in front of the camera and do the regular tap dancing act that I used to do when it came to the PR stuff promoting the ride. Um, and I'm, so I'm not actually going to be involved. I come to um, uh, development meetings every couple of months and I'll keep an eye on the ride and um, I will look forward to opening day as I'm sure you all are. So that's SW8, quite simply. I think you will, you will thoroughly enjoy it. I think it's going to be a super ride. It's very, very different to anything else at Orton Towers. A huge amount of thought uh, and, and talent has gone into it. It is being built uh, as, as, as we speak. The American crew are over here. 
Um, two large containers of timber arrived the week before last. More timber is heading its way across the Atlantic and it's starting to go up. Um, and during the course of the summer, you will, you will see it all, all happening. So that's it. That's all I can really tell you. But I think you'll, you'll really, really like that ride when it's, when it's opened. Who's next? When you started doing um, stuff with the industry, it was quite young, and so there wasn't really much of a plan in place as to how you would come up with rides. So you worked on pretty much everything at once. Whereas now, you'd have people working on Blue Sky, and people working on engineering and everything else. Do you think that offers a benefit to the ultimate ride design, or do you think it's ultimately a hindrance? Also from the back. Well, well, I started... <laughs> <laughs> I, I started, yes, a long, long time ago. Um, uh, for those of you that, that, that don't know the story, I was given the task of taking an ailing zoo, in other words, Chessington Zoo, and turning it around. It was literally going down the tubes. Madame Tussauds owned it, um, and um, I was asked to go to Chessington, and my brief was to sort out, and these are the very words they used, sort out the fun fair and the circus. And so I went to Chessington, this is now 1980, or something like three or four. Um, who was not born in 1983 or four? Nearly every hand in the room. <laughs> um, I, um, I went to Chessington, I walked around, and I thought that the answer to Chessington's <coughs> problems were not a case of sorting out the fun fair and the circus. In other words, replacing a, a tatty traditional fun fair with a slightly better, probably continental fun fair and a and a very very poor um, circus with a, a better circus. It needed something much more radical than that. So I wrote a, a letter basically saying that, and I had a letter back saying, "Thank you very much. Don't call us. We'll call you." And it all went deadly quiet. And then about a year later, uh, I got a phone call from a guy who said, you don't know me, but my name's Ray Barrett, and I have just taken over as board director responsible for Chessington. And I've been looking through uh, the files, and I found a rather enigmatic letter from you saying that you don't think the answer to Chessington's problems is sorting out the funfair and the circus. And reading between the lines, it sort of implies that you do think you know what the answer is. And I said, yeah, I do. So he said, well, come up with a plan. So over the course of about three months, I came up with a plan, which involved a themed flume ride, a Mac runaway train ride, a monorail, dark ride, a few other bits and pieces, all on different themes. I built some models, including a working model of the runaway train ride, actually. Um, and to my amazement, the main Pearson board said, yes, we'll do it. And that rather kind of took me aback. Now, so in answer to your question, the thing is, we, there were no rules. Nobody had done this before. The big American theme parks had had mega budgets of, of millions and millions of pounds. And the reason why no theme parks had got off the ground in, in Britain was their, their schemes were just too grandiose. Um, and uh, were not viable. And I thought, if only there was a way of cheating. I'd been to the, the Oktoberfest at Munich the previous year, and I had seen the Mac Blaurentian runaway train, portable ride. And I thought, if we slapped a plaster mounted over that, we could pretend it's Big Thunder Railroad on a rather smaller scale. And then I thought, well, we could theme up a flume heavily theme up a flume uh, and call it something else Dragon River or something do it on an oriental theme and the more I thought about it the more I realised that if we were clever we could take standard amusement park equipment high quality amusement park equipment theme it up and decorate it very very heavily so that people didn't associate it with fairground equipment and we could create a theme park which is exactly what we did at Chessington. 
We projected, um, I think, Chessington's first year, we, we pre predicted about one and a quarter million, and I think in its first year it did nearly two million. And Pearson, who owned Madame de Sors at the time, thought, hey, this is money for old rope, let's, let's, get, um, let's get on and develop this even further. But unfortunately, the Royal Borough of Kingston had other ideas and they decided that they would not give planning consent for any other major rides at, at uh, Chessington. And so Pearson said, right, if you're going to be the brand leader, if you're going to have the, 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 the brand leading theme park in Britain, which is what we want, uh, you'd better find another site. So we looked around and we decided that whatever site we chose had to have good access to uh, a population with reasonably high disposable income. Um, uh, it had to be able to obviously have planning consent and very importantly, it had to be an attractive site. Um, every site we looked at, two of those criteria were met, but one all the time was elusive. So when we were offered the Corby Steelworks site, it was a brownfield site, it was great, they were giving us planning permission, whatever we wanted to do. Um, the access from the motorways was great, but it would have cost us an absolute fortune to landscape it and make it look attractive, because it was an old steelworks. We were looked at um, Woburn Abbey. The Duke and Duchess of Bedford, actually amazingly enough, were quite keen on the idea. Uh, they didn't seem to worry about having a theme park in their back garden, but um, uh, when we looked at it, it had, again, excellent access. It had um, uh, a good, good affluent population around it, but the local authority said there is no way we're going to give you planning permission on a beautiful historic site like that. So again, it was back to the drawing board. Now, we just put in a Hus partnership into Chessington, more or less at the same time as the previous owner of, of Alton Towers, John Broom, had put the pirate ship in here. And we were both having a lot of technical problems with the thing. So I was always on the phone to Alan Brown here at Alton Towers, and Alan Brown was always on the phone to me, working out how, how on earth we could keep the thing running. Um, and um, over the months, every time I phoned up Alton Towers to speak to Alan Brown or some of the technical people here, they all said, oh, they're not here, they're down in London at the Battersea. Well, the Battersea Power Station project was John Broom's baby, and uh, he had said that, that this was going to be the greatest leisure complex uh, that, that England had ever seen. Um, and um, it was very obvious that the project was going down the tubes, and it was bleeding Norton Towers of all its resources. He was dragging staff from Norton Towers up there, to, to, to try to keep the project afloat. And I thought, well, perhaps Alton Towers might be up for grabs. Um, well, everyone said, no, it's crazy, it'll cost a fortune to buy Alton Towers. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe it doesn't get quite as many visitors as, as they think. And when we did the due diligence exercise, we discovered that most of the rides here were, uh, such as the corkscrew and, and those rides, were actually leased. They weren't owned by Alton Towers. So the actual asset value of Alton Towers wasn't as great as everybody thought. Um, so when Alton Towers came on the market, um, Pearson put in an offer, which was quite low, based on the genuine asset value of Alton Towers. Uh, whereas Granada and First Leisure and the other big leisure companies had fallen for the hype and put in very, very high offers, much higher than ours. But over the course of the next few months, they all dropped out one by one uh, when they realised that actually they weren't going to get what they thought they were getting. So Alton Towers uh, eventually became ours and I was made a director of a company called Tussauds Park Developments and the rest <laughs> is history. But going back to the original uh, question, the, the, the idea was that, that there were no, no rules, we did it the way we wanted to do it. And it's, now, uh, there are vast teams of people, Merlin Magic Making down in London have very, very talented designers and engineers, um, uh, 
scenic artists and so on. But way back then, in those early days of, of first of all, the runaway train in the haunted house and then Nemesis, um, it was kind of sort of down to me. Uh, and that's how I sort of cut my teeth on the business. But yes, it was an awful long time ago and sometimes my memory is a bit, a bit vague as to some of the details. So I hope that answers the question. Which I've forgotten what it was in any case. <laughs> What's next? Do you think that first reality attractions like Galactica and Durham Brown's Ghost Train at Thorpe Park are going to be the way forward for theme parks? Or do you think they're going to die off in a couple of years? Well, that's a very interesting question. I've yet to, to write Durham Brown's Ghost Train. I've had a, uh, an invitation from, um, from Thorpe Park to go down there and, and see it. Um, if you go back about 10 or 15 years, Everyone was talking about simulators. They were going to be the next thing for theme parks. And then holograms. Oh, everything. Holograms are going to conquer the, 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 the... Whoever thinks of holograms nowadays, but it was going to be holograms. Um, I, 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 to answer the question, I don't know. I, I've seen some very spectacular demonstrations of virtual reality. Um, whether, whether they enhance a traditional ride or rejuvenate an, additional, uh, an existing ride, I don't know. I've got to ride Galactica and then I can answer your question probably. Um, but I, I would have said virtual reality definitely has a place within our entertainment industry, but whether it is clamping it onto an existing attraction to give you the kick up the backside, I, I don't know, is, is, is the answer. Um, I think a lot of the problem lies in the fact you've got to wear a cumbersome headset, which is, um, is ungainly and time consuming to put on. And as you, you all well know, when it comes to boarding a ride, it's got to be done very, very quickly if you want the queue to move at a reasonable pace. So, um, I think the headsets are a problem. If there's some way to sort of just plug it straight into your brain, that would be very different. <laughs> I think that's going to take a long time. But, um, but who knows? You know, I, I, I think our industry has to move forward. We have to embrace new technology. Um, but often it's the old ideas with a little bit of a twist that, 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 that are the, the perennials. And I think, in a way, that has been proven here at Orton Towers. It's ironic that still the top top rides are the oldest rides. Um, and, um, um, you know, perhaps uh, perhaps some, some of the old ideas are still the best ideas, providing you keep an open mind and you can, you can rejuvenate those ideas. Who's next? There's lots of people in this room who are very interested in the theme park attraction um, sort of design industry and would love to kind of have a job working somewhere like Merlin Magic Making, mm -hmm. Disney Imagining. Uh, what advice would you have for those kind of people? Right, well, I think the first piece of advice that I would give is be realistic. Um, it, it's, I, I, I used to get lots and lots of wacky ideas sent to me through the post of, of crazy, crazy schemes that would obviously never work. There's nothing wrong with a bit of enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is very important. But in order to be successful in our industry, there are a lot of rather boring, mundane things that you just have to get to grips with. The most important, of course, is safety. You cannot come up with a ride idea that is fundamentally unsafe. Uh, that, and that cannot be made safe. Um, and then things like money. Uh, as I say, none of the rides that I was ever involved in ever went over budget and ever opened late. They always opened on time and on budget, and I'm very proud of that. But th 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 that's a bit of a boring thing when you, when you imagine designing wonderful theme park rides. It's, it's very important that you should be prepared to step out of your own uh, mind into the mind of other people and 
work out what other people want. You know, just because you like a particular thing, just because you're mad on roller coasters doesn't mean to say that everyone else is going to be crazy on roller coasters. That, that you, you've got to be able to um, analyse what is it that entertains people, what is it that thrills them, that surprises them. It's not all about the most terrifying attraction. You're playing with people's emotions, you're intriguing them, you're enchanting them, you're thrilling them, you're surprising them, you're amusing them. Um, so you have to realise that you are an entertainer. You might be an entertainer not on stage but, but playing with nuts and bolts and, and creating a hardware that's going to do the entertaining. But you are still an entertainer and the, the, the palette of tools that you're using are exactly the same as the palette of tools that a stand-up comic or a singer or whatever is doing. They're basically taking an audience and, and manipulating their emotions. Uh, you're taking an audience that comes out of the everyday mundane world where they're concerned about their jobs and their family life and uh, politics and whether North Korea is going to blow up the rest of the world and this sort of thing and for, for a few hours you're, ta you're taking people out of that, that mundane world as a side track to that the one thing that really does make me despair is the wretched mobile phone because once upon a time people would come through the turnstiles Dalton Towers and be in a totally different world and now they're texting, they're phoning, they're back, back in their homes, they're back in their, in their high streets, if you like, in contact. And, and it's such a shame that you, you now no longer leave the, the outside world, the everyday world, and come into a very, very special, magical place. And I think the mobile phone has, 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 has ruined the atmosphere, actually, on our parks. Um, but... Uh, it's very important that you, you take an analytical approach. The job opportunities are very, very slim, unfortunately. Um, and whereas, you know, my background was, was originally in the theatre and then in, in films and film special effects, that is one avenue. Another avenue is through design. Another avenue, and probably the most realistic avenue, is, is to work on a park. And once you're, you're working, say, at Norton Towers, that's when you will find all the different opportunities for becoming more creative. Once upon a time, all the creative work was, was done here at Orton Towers. Now, um, it's all done with, with Merlin Magic Making down, down in London. So if you want to get onto the, onto the, into the creative side, you can't do it here at Orton Towers anymore. Although having said that, there is a branch of their, their, their scenic construction studios called Studios North, which is based at Orton Towers and employs uh, artists and, and uh, fabricators up here. Um, but the job opportunities are few and far between. Um, I would say that it's very important, though, that you should be realistic uh, and accept the fact that, that, that there are times when your runaway enthusiasm perhaps isn't quite so... Uh, so much of an asset as, as you might think. Um, I, I wish I could be more more helpful because I know an awful lot of people would like to work in this business. Um, but as I say, the, the job opportunities are few and far between. But those that really pursue it, that really want to want to get into it, find a way in. And and there, there are lots and lots of very talented people down down at Merlin Magic Making in London. Um, young people, people in the, the, that have uh, left art school and, and college uh, that are making, making careers in the industry. So there are opportunities and if you are determined, you can get in. Um, are there any projects that you've ever done that have been rejected or um, that have not been put through? And if so, what's the one thing you've always one that you've wanted to do the most? Well, well, the classic, of course, was the secret weapon um, that gives the, the SW projects their name. Uh, the, originally, uh, we were going to build an Arrow uh, pipeline coaster, and um, that 
never came to fruition, thank goodness. <laughs> or else we wouldn't have built Nemesis. Um, the, the one, the major frustration is that uh, after, let me think, after Oblivion, I was racking my brains as to what the next ride should be. Um, and, um, and I thought a Woody would be the answer. And I spoke to uh, our directors in London and they said, well, they're a bit kind of old fashioned and unsafe and so on, but if you want to uh, investigate, um, you can do a bit of spade work. So I was very friendly with the McNamara's at Oakwood and they said to me, we want a big ride, what, what should we build? And I said, build a Woody and, and let me be involved. And the answer to that was okay, and we, we built, built Megaphobia. Who's written Megaphobia? Right, I, I, and obviously I learned a lot from Megaphobia, and I thought that would be the ideal ride, but much bigger for Alton Towers. So I put it to the board and put them on a train and sent them down to Oakwood, and they thought Megaphobia was fabulous. And they said, yes, that's what we must build, but we've got to put it into market research. Now, market research is the kiss of death on any entertainment product. If you were to say to a market researcher, um, what should a comedian's perfect joke be? He, they probably do some research and discover it's got to be sort of three minutes, 17 seconds long. It's got to you know, feature an Irishman uh, and, and a nun. And, it's, uh, it's got, and they, they would completely take all the humour out of it. Well, when they put a wooden coaster into market research, um, back came the answer that the public perception in Britain of wooden coasters were, were that what they were old fashioned and they were unsafe. And so they said there is no way that we can build that type of ride at Alton Towers. And I said, yeah, but once we built it, it'll be fabulous and everyone will want to ride it. And the word will get around. And they said, yeah, we can't wait for the word to get around. We have to ensure that from opening day, the thing starts paying back. Uh, and we can't sort of allow public opinion to build up over the first year and then it be a big success in year two. We've got to actually make a success of this from, from day one, which was, I felt, rather defeatist. But I wasn't letting this go. And over the years, every time we opened a new ride, I would put forward a scheme for a wooden coaster for Alton Towers. And it's just rather ironical that after I go and retire, Alton Towers eventually <laughs> decide they're going to build a wooden coaster. It's nice that they have tried to involve me in it. Unfortunately, it was a bit too late for me to seriously influence the coaster. But um, uh, I think probably the biggest regret I have got of my career is that I've only ever done two, two wooden coasters, th th those being Megaphobia and the Stampeder at Port Aventura. Has anyone ridden the Stampeder? Yeah, well, well, well there again, that, that was... Every time I design a ride, I want it to be different, not for the sake of it. I don't necessarily want to get into the Guinness Book of Records with the highest and the fastest world, but I want something to be somewhat different. And uh, the idea of a twin track racer where the two trains ran along parallel tracks side by side, both went into a tunnel and when they emerged from the tunnel, the train that you're racing against isn't there anymore. And before you have time to work out what's happening, it's coming at you in the opposite direction. Uh, and that took a lot of working out. Uh, and eventually we worked out how to do it. And then I thought, but this is going to have a height restriction which prohibit uh, young children from riding. So let's bolt on a third track that is a kiddie track and let that kiddie track join the race at the end. And damn it, let's let the kiddies win the race quite a few times. <laughs> so I was very pleased with, with, with the Stampeder. Um, 
I was very pleased with Megaphobia. I thought they were good rides. And certainly all the, all the woodies that I did design over the years for here, which, which are now <laughs> residing in, in, in my filing cabinets, um, would have been great rides. But at long last, you are going to have a woody, and I'm sure that you'll, you'll enjoy it. But that, that's the, the, main, the main, the only regret I've got in my career was that I was never actually able to build my dream woody at Dalton Towers. In a similar vein to um, the Air Galactica question, I want to know your thoughts on Bubble Works closing and changing into the Gruffalo at Jessington. And uh, do you think they've gone the right way choosing an IP for it? Well, there again, I've not seen it. I've seen some YouTube videos and it does look fabulous, I have to say. Um, the, the, the Bubble Works, the Bubble Works is originally I mean, it was a very successful ride. It, it, it was the, 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 the highest accolade that you can get in the theme park industry is the National Amusement Park Historical Association in America voted it for about seven consecutive years the, the third best dark ride in the world. Uh, the first, the top, the top ride was, was always the Pirates of the Caribbean. The second ride was the Haunted Mansion at Knobles Grove which is an amazing ride, that's in, in Pennsylvania, and the Bubble Works was always the third best dark ride in the world, which is the finest accolade that anyone could ask for. Um, it was the Money Men that then decided that they were going to get sponsorship for a ride at Chessington, and uh, I think Cussons, the, the uh, soap people, put forward a lot of money, and the Bubble Works was rethemed on... Soap, I think. I never saw it. It, it broke my heart, the fact that, that, that the bubble works had been torn apart and, and the fizzy pop had been turned into soap bubbles. Um, uh, so I, I do personally feel that was a retrograde move. Um, but I do think that having, having done that, it needed re-sorting re, re out. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with an intellectual property, providing it's a, a robust one. One of the problems of using intellectual properties in our industry is that if you were to do some research and work out what is the, the, the hot property at the moment, the problem is by the time you have then designed whatever that attraction is and built it and it opens three years later, that hot property might now be very lukewarm. Um, whereas I think they've sensibly chosen a property which is, is very robust and, and, and durable. And certainly the YouTube videos I've seen of the ride, it does look very good. Um, it looks as if it's been beautifully themed. Um, and, and time will tell if, it, if it's a success, but I believe it is. Seeing as flat rides are scarce here at all towers, do you think Merlin will be putting any new ones in any time soon, especially as Slammer close this week? Yeah, flat, the, the issue that I've always had with flat rides is that, that um, unless they are something very, very special, um, similar rides pop up on travelling fairgrounds. And why should people come to uh, travel a long distance to Orton Towers to go on a ride which they can see on their local village green. Um, Geoffrey Thompson from Blackpool Pleasure Beach used to agree with me on this, that, that, that they avoided at Blackpool. And it would have been very easy for them to put in standard rides, but they didn't. They, they put a lot of money and effort into developing their own unusual, sometimes flat rides, not, not always track rides or whatever. Um, and they, flat rides have always been regarded as, as a filler between your main big rides. I've always felt there's nothing wrong with a flat ride as long as you do something with it. And I was the very first person to put fountains under a hoof top spin. We did it at Chessington. Um, I got the idea from a ride at Tibidamo in Barcelona, where they had ornamental fountains decorating the underside of a ride. And when I saw the top spin at um, 
I think it was either the Munich Oktoberfest or, 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 or possibly well, one of the other travelling fairs in, in Germany with the, with, the, with the gondola hanging upside down. I thought if we put fountains underneath and squirted them up and down, that, that could not only look pretty, but it could add to the ride. So we did that at Chessington, and then the world copied us. Everybody that had a top spin, even traveling portable top spins put, put fountains under their rides. If, if, if I had 10 Deutschmarks for every top spin that's got fountains underneath it, I'd be a very wealthy man. But I think there's nothing wrong with flat rides, as long as you don't take a standard production model ride, which is intended for a traveling fair, uh, and, uh, and plonk it in a, in a theme park and, and make out that it is a themed ride. And, and the basic philosophy to a theme park is that you're not in a fun fair, but you are taking on adventures. The, the other problem with flat rides is, is capacity. You know, a well-designed coaster can gobble up well in excess of a thousand an hour. Um, the, the best example here is, is 13 and uh, 13 actually exceeded its theoretical capacity on its opening day, which is an amazing achievement that the, the staff managed to do that. But flat rides tend to be very capacity inefficient vis-a-vis -vis the, the number of staff that they require. Um, and a typical flat ride will do about three or 400 an hour. So you need an awful lot of flat rides to make up the same capacity that you would get from a, a well-designed track ride. Things like the Haunted House here, or Jewel as they now call it, is, um, you know, that transit system can, can, can handle about 14, 1500 people an hour. It would take probably five flat rides to be able to move that sort of queue at that speed. So. Um, that's the other drawback of flat rides. It's a dead easy cop out. Anyone can bung in a few flat rides. You don't you don't need to get off your backside. You just just go through, go on the internet, find a few manufacturers, and and, and order a, a standard flat ride. And the only creative work that people do is work out what colour they're going to paint it and what silly name they're going to give it. So so that's that's the issue with flat rides. There's nothing wrong with 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 having them, um, but. Um, they aren't the answer to creating a unique and very special theme park that people want to travel long distances to, to visit. What's your favourite roller coaster at Ulm Towers? Guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's answered that one. <laughs> Yes, it'll always be Nemesis. Nemesis was a very special, special thing for me. Um, it, and in fact, Walter Bolliger still reckons that it's, it's his best uh, inverted coaster, even though he has built dozens of, of inverted coasters that are twice, three times the size and twice or three times the height. But in terms of getting it all right, and the fact that it is still the most popular ride at Orton Towers 20 odd years later, um, I, I, that, that certainly is, is my favorite ride. Apart from maybe Nemesis, what is the most proud memory you have of your total career? Well, that's an interesting one. I mean, when, whenever you open a, a new attraction, I suppose you get tremendous pride on opening day and for the very first time seeing what you think of as a machine, a, a regular machine made of nuts and bolts and steel and electric motors and computers actually creating thrills and excitement and screams. So that, that is the, every, every single ride opening and thank goodness I've not actually been involved in a dud yet there isn't much opportunity for me to, to be involved in the dud now. Um, uh, so on opening day, just to stand back. Although I always have very mixed emotions for on opening day because it, it's rather like giving birth. You, you, you're handing over your baby, something that you have been creating for maybe two, three years, and suddenly it's no longer yours. It's the park's. 
it, they operate it, it's theirs, you've, you've no longer got, got a part of it. And I can distinctly remember sitting uh, on one of the rocks beneath Nemesis with Walter Bolliger. Walter came over for, o for the opening day and um, all the crowds were all hyped up, massive great long queues and of course nobody knew who we were so we were just quietly sat, sat there and, and suddenly this cloud of depression came over me because I suddenly realised that, that it was all over, you know, it was no longer mine and then I, I, I said to Walter, you realise we've got a hell of a problem here and he looked at me with absolute horror and said, what's that? I said, how the hell do we top this? <laughs> And that's when our brains started working, and, and, and we came up with the idea of, the, of a vertical, vertical drop coaster. But, um, yes, it's, uh, it, I, I do have great mixed emotions when it comes to, to, to opening, opening rides, but I get a huge sense of, of pride. And even now when I come to the parks, I just lurk in the background and, and, and watch the queue. I mean, obviously a lot of you know who I am, but most people on the park don't, although it's surprising how, how many people do recognise me and, and come up and, and say the nicest things. I mean, it, it really is it's so heartwarming when people come up, or I get emails from people. Almost every day I get an email saying, oh, thank you very much for all the pleasure that you brought me and now my children and, and all that sort of thing. So it, it, it is very, very heartwarming and, and something that I, I don't take for granted at all. Yeah. We saw you earlier um, sort of walking over to the Nemesis area. Lurking. Lurking, yeah, <laughs> as you said, lurking. Um, I think me and a few other people that I was stood near were kind of wondering what you what you were thinking as you were walking around the area and having a look at the ride and all of us lot enjoying it as much as we all do. Um, yeah, just thinking about seeing what you were thinking about really. Oh, well, I just love being part of that thing. Um, it was designed to entertain more people watching it than actually riding it. You, you probably tweaked that nearly all the rides that I, I design, I design not assuming that everybody is going to want to ride them or have the guts to ride them or the physical ability to ride them. And I feel as if I have a responsibility to entertain as many people as possible. Now when we acquired Alton Towers, the Rapids ride was already here. It was, oh no, it, well, the Rapids wasn't the longest in the world, the Flume was the longest Flume ride in the world. But the Rapids ride was, the entrance to the Rapid ride was next to where the entrance to the Flume ride is. Uh, I was going to say now, but it isn't anymore, is it? Um, uh, and you couldn't even get a glimpse of that ride unless you went through a, 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 an entrance and a chain, went along a chain link fence. And, and then the first glimpse you got of it was getting, literally, get, just before you got onto the platform to ride it. Uh, and I thought, this is ridiculous. There is so much fun to be had just watching people on the ride, so much atmosphere that can be created. Um, so, uh, you know, watching rides and being part of a ride when you're not actually riding it is, is very important to me. And I get that pleasure. So, you know, when I was... I, 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 haven't, I haven't seen Nemesis this year, so I haven't seen the new paint job that they've done on it, and at least it's boosted it up quite nicely because it was looking a bit sad. Um, but I was, I just get such a, a, a lot of pleasure out of it, seeing what is a beautiful piece of, of, of engineering. I mean, it, it, it is a superb machine, um, built by the, the finest ride engineers in the world, who I have a very special relationship with. Um, you know, B and M, they, they're a very low key organisation. They're very elite, only, only the top parks in the world can, can afford to use them. And they don't divulge uh, much information at all. If they think you can afford the ride and they think that you're worthy of it, then they will condescend to talk to you about it. And providing you put a down payment down, then they will, they will engage in a contract with you. But um, I very quickly, with Nemesis, 
uh, developed a rapport with with Walter Bolliger and Claude Mabillard, and they actually divulged a lot of very confidential technical information, which enabled me to piece together the layout of Nemesis, which was admittedly based on on the original Six Flags Superman prototype ride, but totally reconfigured, and. Uh, Obviously, the Superman ride was based on a flat level site. So, by reconfiguring the ride so that the station was halfway up the ride and there was a, a, a barrel roll right at the end and the loop base was way below the station, it involved a lot of recalculation. And that was something that I worked very closely with, with, with Claude Mabillard on. Um, and um, uh, it still is a very special ride. Uh, people, park operators from all around the world still come and see Nemesis. As I say, it's probably now one of the smallest B&M inverters in the world. And B uh, Walter Bolliger still reckons it's, it's his best. So I, I get a lot of pleasure out of Nemesis and, and seeing all of you enjoying it. So that's what I was thinking when I was walking around. <laughs> if you could install any uh, ride manufacturer and the location, where, what would you do and where would it be? Here? Here at Orton Towers. Well, you may have been familiar with what we turned the Cross Valley poster. <coughs> Um, Nick Varney always likes to uh, be able to claim some sort of world's first and we were never going to be able to build a massive great high coaster it was prohibitively expensive to build the world's highest coaster by doing a nemesis and going into the ground but we did have a valley and I do feel that that Cross Valley Coaster would have been a fabulous ride. Um, I've still got the plans for it and if Alton Towers ever want to build it, I'm prepared to dig the plans out of the, out of the filing cabinet. But um, I, I think it would be that. In terms of the manufacturer, uh, as I say, uh, B&M are <coughs> way up there at the top. Um, that the, they, we have a very good, or we had a very good match. I say we, we had because it's no longer up to me. Um, I, I still have a very, very good relationship with, with, with uh, Walter Bolliger. They uh, are quite a sort of closed organisation. When, as you, as you know, we went head to head with Blackpool. They were building the big one when we did, when we did Nemesis, and um, they were shouting about. You know, they're wonderful, tallest, fastest, highest, everything is coaster in the world. Um, about a, well over a year before it opened. And we kept very quiet about Nemesis. And the result was that um, by the time uh, the run up to a couple of months before Nemesis opened, um, the media had kind of got a bit sort of um, hyped out with. with with Blackpool and focused on Nemesis and we, we got much better coverage. Um, so um, when it came to uh, air, we, Walter and I both felt that we wanted to crack a flying coaster. Now we didn't know that Vicoma were also doing it. Um, we didn't know how we were going to do it. Um, but we decided that somehow we had to find a way of getting you in a flying position quickly, safely, comfortably, so that you could fly. Um, and uh, it was very, very important that nobody should know what we were doing. Now, I don't know whether any of you remember the run-up to air, but, but the, <laughs> the, the word got out, how I don't know, but that we were going to do a flying coaster and but nobody knew how we were going to do it. They knew that Vicoma were going to put you in a seated position facing backwards and then turn the train over in a, a sort of a, a barrel roll or a rifle of, of, of track to get you in the down-facing position. Um, 
we weren't going to do that. But we decided that in order to get, uh, because as soon as you, you develop a new ride, it gets copied. To start off with, it was, it was the Italians that would copy it, and now, now it's the Chinese. You can forget patents, you can forget registered designs, it gets copied. Um, when we built the runaway train at Chessington, in fact, someone had copied our runaway train before our runaway train actually opened. So, um, it, it was important to us, and also to b and that, that it was kept secret until eventually the ride opened. And they set up the most amazingly secure development facility. They're based in Monti in Switzerland on Lake Geneva, on a big trading estate. But they set up a development facility separate from their own production facility, with just two engineers working on it in, the, in, in its own workshops, and nobody was allowed in. Nobody other than Walter and Claude knew what, what, what was happening behind closed doors. And if you if any of you have read my book, you'll see a picture of me in testing out the prototype in their workshop. It was all lashed up with plywood and, and, and foam and everything, just to see how, whether it would work. Um, and it wasn't until opening day that people found out how, how the thing worked. Um, but that too was... was uh, 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 it was a collaboration that worked extremely well. So in terms of which manufacturer, without a shadow of doubt, it would be B&M. The only problem is B&M do stick to roller coasters. There was no question. We, I came up with an idea for a new kind of water ride a few years ago. And uh, I said to, to, to B&M, would you like to work with us on it? And they said, well, thank you, but no thank you. We build roller coasters. Um, and, and that was the end of the matter. So. Uh, if it's going to be a coaster, without a shadow of doubt, B&M, but if it's another manufacturer for other things, well, so be it. Does that answer the question? Yeah. You the question you get your... Let you question. If we could get hands up nice and high, guys, it really helps see you. Okay, thank you. So, um, at the time, there were a lot of other rides that were being built, mainly at Chessington. You know, a few dark rides, there was Terra Toon, Fifth Dimension, Fifth Dimension again when that got redone, uh, Hex in 2001 when that had its adjustments, and of course those were all different teams. Uh, what do you think of those attractions? Do you think the teams did a good job and if you could do anything better? Well, the, the only dark ride that I've actually had control of was the Bubble Works. The, but basically, when we started doing Chessington, Madame Tussauds Studios felt that that Chessington was a bit beneath them. It was a fun fair, and they, they, they were artists. They did wonderful portraits of the Queen and all this sort of thing. So they didn't want anything to do with Chessington. But Ian Hansen, the head of studios at Madame de Swords, um, got quite revved up about the idea of a dark ride. He'd been to, to Disneyland and he came up with the idea of a dark ride. So although the building layout and the transit system was something that I came up with, the actual fifth dimension ride was a product of Madame Tussauds Studios. I was fully engaged on all the other rides at Chessington, and as far as dark rides were concerned in, in year two, yes, it was year two, the Bubble Works and the Vampire. Um, the, the next sort of ride that I did have an influence in was the, the old Round the World in 80 Days ride here at Alton Towers was just not up to scratch. And so, uh, but by this time, Madame Sword Studios had realised that, that perhaps theme parks weren't quite as, as, uh, as, as tacky as they thought and were getting a bit revved up. So I worked with them on Toyland Tours here. Um, and then when it came to the Haunted House, um, the Haunted House was an interesting one because we, we decided we needed to build a, a good dark ride here, a big dark ride, that a spooky haunted theme was probably the, the, the right way to go, but we needed high capacity. And um, everyone assumed that we would go for an endless transit system because that does give high capacity. For those of you that don't know what an endless transit system is, 
it's, it's like the Haunted Mansion in Disneyland. It is an endless train of, of vehicles that move slowly, non-stop through the ride. The problem is that it's very apparent to the rider that whatever's going to happen to you is happening to the person in the car immediately in front of them and they're not freaking out and neither are the people ahead of them and so on. So there isn't a sense of being alone and of exploring. So I thought if there was a way of having individual cars that moved slowly through the station bumper to bumper without stopping, but then leaving the station and peeling off and going around the ride on their own, um, that would give you uh, a much more uh, exciting experience. So I worked with Mac on that and the transit system um, on the second day of opening was very, very successful. For those of you that have read the book, you'll know the horrors of opening day of, of, of the haunted house and what went wrong and how we managed to um, convince the media that everything was going according to plan. But my goodness, that, that was without doubt the worst moment of my career was, was the opening day of the haunted house. Um, uh, but eventually we got it working and the haunted house was very successful, so I'm quite pleased as a, as an, as a dark ride attraction. Dark rides are very difficult things. They're hole in the wall attractions. By that we mean that, that you can't actually see what's going to happen until you go through the hole in the wall into the ride. They're very, very difficult things to market. Um, that's why having an intellectual property like Harry Potter or whatever, Doctor Who, you know, it, it, it does make it much, much easier to market the ride. Um, but um, dark rides are tricky things, very tricky and uh, difficult to actually hit the headlines with, with, with dark rides. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah. yeah. Two more questions, please, guys. Uh, as a man that's pretty much seen everything behind the scenes as you probably could see, um, and you've said that you still visit the parks as a guest, how do you keep the magic alive and how do you still go back to just being a person enticing the magic? Um, well, I think perhaps the most thrilling day of my career was a day I spent backstage in the Tower of Terror in um, uh, Disney Studios in, in, in Orlando. I was very fortunate enough to um, um, have a, a whole day. The Tower of Terror is run as a completely separate attraction to all the other attractions in that particular park. It has its own staff, it has its own wardrobe department, it has its own staff canteen, everything is separate. It even has its own separate backstage entrance. So the, the staff in the rest of the park have no contact with, whatsoever with the Tower of Terror. And I was asked to get there at six o'clock in the morning and they kept nothing back. They showed me absolutely everything. And it, it is run like a theatre show. For those of you that, that know anything about professional theatre, um, 35 minutes before curtain up is what they call the half. It stands for half hour, but it's not half an hour before it's, it's 35 minutes before. When all the cast must be in place, they then um, go to the wardrobe department, they, they put on their makeup, and then about 10 minutes before, they'll be called down to the stage and they'll get into character. And the Tower of Terror works exactly the same way. The staff are, are performers, they uh, get into costume, they rehearse. They get into character and they get into position for the ride opening. The ride is, is being maintained throughout the night. It's a very, very complicated piece of equipment. And I was privileged to, to see it all working and how it works. And then they took me up onto the gantry on the big neon sign outside where the vehicles actually momentarily appear when the doors open at the top just before the big drop the photograph is taken and then they drop and I spent about half an hour sat on that gantry way up the top watching everybody's face which is great fun <laughs> so that was that was the um, that was probably the highlight of, of, of my career but um, a similar thing happened when we when we opened 13 
you, you probably don't realize the way in which the trains sequence in 13. And you don't really appreciate it until you actually go onto the maintenance gantry at the top of the drop in 13. Because when you're a rider, you think you're completely alone and, and the drop happens and you go out the back. If you go up on that maintenance gallery, you see it's, it's quite spectacular because as soon as the train has been fired out the bottom, within a fraction of a second of the train clearing the drop track, the drop track is shooting straight back up to the top and within a matter of a couple of seconds of the drop track being located in place and the safety systems clearing the block, the next train is in and then that's down and back. And that thing is going up and down, up and down at a most incredible rate. And it gives me a great thrill because although you as riders experience a very personal experience, what I see up there are literally thousands of people going through that machine every hour. It's, well, no, I'm exaggerating slightly. Uh, uh, we're talking about, on a, on a good day, about 1,400 people an hour going through that machine. And I get a great thrill watching that. And it's something that I suppose I'm quite privileged because other than myself and the maintenance engineers, no one else gets to see that. So that, that's another, another area that really gives me a tingle in the, in, in the, in the spine, yeah. Okay, last question. In terms of like all the innovative technology you worked on over the years, have you got a favourite one that you've done? In terms of technology, I think the bit of technology that I like best is gravity. It's terribly reliable. It never fails you. And, and it always ensures that what leaves the station, or at least what leaves the top of the lift, tends to get back into the station. So gravity is a lovely piece of technology, if you can call it technology. Um, you know, there are so many different technologies. The way computers now can control rides and control safety systems, there's no such thing as computers when we first built, built, built the rides. Um, well, they were, but they, but they were things that belonged in laboratories and stuff. Um, so as far as, as far as technology is concerned, it, it's probably the simplest stuff that, 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 that's the best. And stuff that I can get my mind around, I can't get my mind around all this wonderful new stuff. I thought the last question was going to be the worst. It was a dead easy one. Has anyone got a stinker of a question? One last question. <laughs> uh, I'll ask one. Um, I really enjoyed your last book. Do you plan on maybe writing another one? Well, <laughs> the last book was the last book was the first book. No, there's, there's, there's one story. That, that, that's it. That, that's it. I, I do tweak the book from time to time. Um, a slip in the odd additional anecdote, but but that's it. They're, you know, they, they say there's a book in, in everyone. Um, I was asked to write the book by a journalist who had interviewed me, and he said, um, I, I, I'd given him various anecdotes, and he said, there's a book here, you've got, you've got to write a book. And I said, no one's going to buy that. And he said, you give it a try. So just for a bit of a laugh, on uh, the day I decided to retire, and you've, you've all got a long way to go before you do that, but, but it's most ex you have a most extraordinary feeling. You sit down at your desk or your computer, and you think, what the hell do I do? It's really a very strange feeling. And your self-esteem goes out the window. You think, that's it, I'm, I'm past it now. Um, um, that's when I thought, right, well, my fingers are just hovering over the keyboard, Let's let's start the book. So so I did, and and um, interestingly enough, it sold more this Christmas as Christmas presents than it sold at any Christmas before, um, and still continues to, to to sell quite well. So thank you very much if you bought it. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. Um, as I said earlier, we're very, very grateful for you being here again today. I um, appreciate you taking some time. Um, so, big round of applause for John Ward. Thank you very much. We've got a little something
for you. Oh. I hope you still like champagne. Oh. And we have a card which is actually signed by everyone here today. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, as I say, thank you very much for, for inviting me. I, I, I really do get a great kick out of seeing everybody and, and uh, I, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>